Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. The Anglo-American Establishment by Carol Quigley Chapter 12 Foreign Policy, 1919-1940 Part 5 After the dreadful deed was done, the round table had not a word of regret and hardly a kind word for the great sacrifice of the Czechs, or for the magnificent demonstration of restraint which they had given the world. In fact, the leading article in the December 1938 issue of the Round Table began with a severe criticism of Czechoslovakia for failure to reconcile her minorities, for failure to achieve economic cooperation with her neighbours, and for failure to welcome a Habsburg restoration. From that point on, the article was honest. While accepting Munich, it regarded it solely as a surrender to German power and rejected the arguments that it was done by negotiation, that it was a question of self-determination or minority rights, or that Munich was any better or more lenient than the Godesberg demands. The following article in the same issue, also on Czechoslovakia, is a tissue of untruths except for the statement that there never was any real Sudeten issue, since the whole thing was a fraudulent creation engineered from Germany. Otherwise, the article declares categorically, 1. That Czechoslovakia could not have stood up against Hitler more than two or three weeks. 2. That no opposition of importance to Hitler existed in Germany. A good deal has been written about the opposition of the military commanders, but in fact it does not and never did exist. 3. There is no such thing as a conservative opposition in Germany. In the middle of such statements as these, one ray of sanity shines like a light. In a single sentence, the round table tossed onto the scrap heap its basic argument in support of appeasement, namely the injustices of Versailles. The sentence reads, quote, It is not Versailles, but defeat that is the essential German grievance against the Western powers. Close quote. This sentence should have been printed in gold letters in the Foreign Office in London in 1919 and read daily thereafter. It is worthy of note that this issue of the Round Table discussed the Czech crisis in two articles of 27 pages and had only one sentence on Russia. This sentence spoke of the weakness of Russia, where, quote, a new Tiberius had destroyed the morale and the material efficiency of the Russian army, close quote. However, in a separate article dealing largely with Soviet-German relations, we find these significant sentences. Quote, the Western democracies appear to be framing their policies on the principle of letting Germany go east. The fu Russia faces the fundamental need of preventing a hostile coalition of the great powers of Western Europe. Close quote. The final judgment of the Milner Group on the Munich surrender could probably be found in the December 1938 issue of the Round Table, where we read the following, quote, The nation as a whole is acutely aware that Anglo-French predominance, resulting from victory in the Great War, is now a matter of history, that the conception of an international society has foundered because the principle of the rule of law was prostituted to perpetuate an impossible equality, the terms of the Versailles Treaty might have been upheld for some time longer by the consistent use of military power, notably when Germany remilitarized the Rhineland zone. But it was illogical to expect a defeated and humiliated foe to accept inferiority as the immutable concomitant of a nobler world, 
and it was immoral to try to build the city of God on lopsided foundations. Close quote. As late as the March 1939 issue, the round table point of view remained unchanged. At that time it said, quote, The policy of appeasement which Mr Chamberlain represents, and which he brought to what seemed to be its most triumphant moment at Munich, was the only possible policy on which the public opinion of the different nations of the Commonwealth could have been unified. It had already been unanimously approved in general terms at the Imperial Conference of 1937. Close quote. The German occupation of Bohemia and Moravia in March 1939 marked the turning point for the Milner Group, but not for the Chamberlain Group. In the June 1939 issue, the leading article of the Round Table was entitled from appeasement to grand alliance. Without expressing any regrets about the past, which it regarded as embodying the only possible policy, it rejected appeasement in the future. It demanded a grand alliance of Poland, Romania, France, Britain and others. Only one sentence referred to Russia. It said, quote, Negotiations to include Soviet Russia in the system are continuing. Close quote. Most of the article justified the previous policy as inevitable in a world of sovereign states. Until federation abolishes sovereignty and creates a true world government amenable to public opinion, the nations will continue to live in anarchy, whatever their contractual obligations may be. And under conditions of anarchy, it is power and not public opinion that counts. The fundamental, though not the only, explanation of the tragic history of the last eight years is to be found in the failure of the English-speaking democracies to realise that they could prevent aggression only by unity and by being strongly armed enough to resist it wherever it was attempted. Close quote. This point of view had been expressed earlier in the House of Lords by Lothian and Astor. On the 12th of April 1939, the former said, One of her Hitler's great advantages has been that, for very long, what he sought a great many people all over the world felt was not unreasonable, whatever they may have thought of his methods. But that justification has completely and absolutely disappeared in the last three months. It began to disappear in my mind at the Godesberg Conference. I think the right answer to the situation is what Mr Churchill has advocated elsewhere, a grand alliance of all those nations whose interest is paramountly concerned with the maintenance of their own status quo. But in my view, if you are going to do that, you have got to have a grand alliance which will function not only in the west of Europe, but also in the east. I agree with what my noble friend Lord Snell has just said, that in that eastern alliance, Russia may be absolutely vital. Nobody will suspect me of any ideological sympathy with Russia or communism, I have even less ideological sympathy with Soviet Russia than I had with the Tsarist Russia. But in resisting aggression, it is power alone that counts. He then went on to advocate national service and was vigorously supported by Lord Astor, both in regard to this and in regard to the necessity of bringing Russia into the Grand Alliance. From this point onward, the course of the Milner Group was more rigid against Germany. This appeared chiefly as an increased emphasis on rearmament and national service, policies which the group had been supporting for a long time. Unlike the Chamberlain Group, they learned a lesson from the events of the 15th of March 1939. It would be a mistake, however, to believe that they were determined to resist any further acquisition of territory or economic advantage by Germany. Not at all. They would undoubtedly have been willing to allow frontier rectifications in the Polish corridor 
or elsewhere in favour of Germany, if these were accomplished by a real process of negotiation and included areas inhabited by Germans, and if the economic interests of Poland, such as her trade outlet to the Baltic, were protected. In this, the Milner Group was still motivated by ideas of fairness and justice, and by a desire to avoid a war. The chief charges were two. One, they now felt, as they, in contrast to Chamberlain's group, had long suspected, that peace could be preserved better through strength than by weakness, and two, they now felt that Hitler would not stop at any point based only on justice, but was seeking world domination. The short-run goal of the Milner Group still remained a continent dominated by Hitler between an oceanic bloc on the west and the Soviet Union on the east. That they assumed such a solution would keep the peace, even on a short-term basis, shows the fundamental naivety of the Milner Group. The important point is that this view did not prohibit any modification of the Polish frontiers nor did it require any airtight understanding with the Soviet Union. It did involve an immediate rearming of Britain and a determination to stop Hitler if he moved by force again. Of these three points, the first two were shared with the Chamberlain group, the third was not. The difference rested on the fact that the Chamberlain group hoped to permit Britain to escape from the necessity of fighting Germany by getting Russia to fight Germany. The Chamberlain group did not share the Milner group's naive belief in the possibility of three great power blocks standing side by side in peace. Lacking that belief, they preferred a German-Russian war to a British-German war. And, having that preference, they differed from the Milner group in their willingness to accept the partition of Poland by Germany. The Milner Group would have yielded parts of Poland to Germany if done by fair negotiation. The Chamberlain Group was quite prepared to liquidate Poland entirely if it could be presented to the British people in terms which they would accept without demanding war. Here again appeared the difference we have already mentioned between the Milner Group and Lloyd George in 1918 and between the Group and Baldwin in 1923 namely that the Milner Group tended to neglect the electoral consideration so important to a party politician. In 1939, Chamberlain was primarily interested in building up to a victorious electoral campaign for November, and, as Sir Horace Wilson told German Special Representative Wall in June, quote, It was all one to the government whether the elections were held under the cry be ready for a coming war, or under a cry, a lasting understanding with Germany. Close quote. These distinctions between the point of view of the Milner Group and that of the Chamberlain Group are very subtle, and have nothing in common with the generally accepted idea of a contrast between appeasement and resistance. There were still appeasers to be found, chiefly in those ranks of the Conservative Party most remote from the Milner Group. British public opinion was quite clearly committed to resistance after March 1939. The two government groups between these, with the Chamberlain Group closer to the former and the Milner Group closer to the latter. It is a complete error to say, as most students of the period have said, that before the 15th of March the government was solidly appeasement and afterwards solidly resistant. The Chamberlain Group, after 17th of March 1939, was just as partial to appeasement as before, perhaps more so, but it had to adopt a pretense of resistance to satisfy public opinion and keep a way open to wage the November election on either side of the issue. The Milner Group was anti-appeasement after March, but in a limited way that did not involve any commitment to defend the territorial integrity of Poland or to ally with Russia. This complicated situation is made more so by the fact that the Milner Group was itself disintegrating. 
Some members, chiefly in the second circle, like Hoare or Simon, continued as wholehearted, if secret, appeasers and became closer to Chamberlain. Halifax, who did not have to run for office, could speak his mind more honestly and probably had a more honest mind. He was closer to the Milner group, although he continued to cooperate so closely with Chamberlain that he undoubtedly lost the Prime Minister's post in May 1940 as a result. Amory, closer than Halifax to the inner core of the group, was also more of a resister and, by the middle of 1939, was finished with appeasement. Lothian was in a position between Halifax and Amory. The point of view of the inner core can be found, as usual, in the pages of the Round Table. In the issue of September 1939, the leading article confessed that Hitler's aim was mastery of the world. It continued, quote, In this light, any further accretion of German strength, for instance, through control of Danzig, which is the key to subjection of all Poland, appears as a retreat from the ramparts of the British Commonwealth itself. Perhaps our slowness to realise these facts, or at least to act accordingly in building an impregnable defence against aggression in earlier years, accounts for our present troubles. Close quote. For the Milner group, this constitutes a magnificent confession of culpability. In the December 1939 issue of the Round Table, the whole tone has reverted to that of 1911 to 1918. Gone is the idea that modern Germany was the creation of the United States and Britain, or that Nazism was merely a temporary and insignificant aberration resulting from Versailles. Instead, the issue is Commonwealth or Weltreich. Nazism, quote, is only Prussianism in more brutal shape, close quote. It quotes Lord Lothian's speech of the 25th of October 1939, made in New York, that, quote, the establishment of a true reign of law between nations is the only remedy for war, close quote. And we are told again that such a reign of law must be sought in federation, in the same issue, the whole of Lothian's speech was reprinted as a document. In the March 1940 issue, the round table harked back even further to 1914. It quoted an extensive passage from Pericles' funeral oration in a leading article entitled The Issue, and added, quote, That also is our creed, but it is not Hitler's, close quote. The same point of view of the group is reflected in other places. On the 16th of March 1939, in the Commons, when Chamberlain was still defending the appeasement policy and refusing to criticise Germany's policy of aggression, Lady Astor cried out to him, quote, Will the Prime Minister lose no time in letting the German government know with what horror the whole of this country regards Germany's action? Close quote. The Prime Minister did not answer, but a Conservative member, Major Vivian Adams, hurled at the lady the remark, You caused it yourself. Major Adams was not a man to be lightly dismissed. A graduate of Halebury and Cambridge, past president of the Cambridge Union, member of the Inner Temple Bar, an executive of the League of Nations Union, and a vice president of Lord Davies' new Commonwealth Society, he was not a man who did not know what was going on. He subsequently published two books against appeasement under the pseudonym Watchman. Most of the members of the inner core of the group who took any public stand on these issues refused to rake over the dead embers of past policy and devoted themselves to a programme of preparedness and national service. 
the names of Amory, Grigg, Lothian and the Times became inseparably associated with the campaign for conscription, which ultimately resulted in the National Service Act of the 26th of April 1939. The more aloof and more conciliatory point of view of Halifax can be seen in his speech of the 9th of June in the House of Lords and the famous speech of the 29th of June before the Royal Institute of International Affairs. The lingering overtones of appeasement in the former resulted in a spirited attack by Lord Davies, while or Arthur Salter, who had earlier been plumping for a Ministry of All the Talents with Halifax as Premier, by the middle of the year was begging him, at all souls, to meet Stalin face to face in order to get an alliance. The events of 1939 do not require our extended attention here, although they have never yet been narrated in any adequate fashion. The German seizure of Bohemia and Morovia was not much of a surprise to either the Milner or Chamberlain groups. Both accepted it, but the former tried to use it as a propaganda device to help get conscription, while the latter soon discovered that, whatever their real thoughts, they must publicly condemn it in order to satisfy the outraged moral feelings of the British electorate. It is this which explains the change in tone between Chamberlain's speech of the 15th of March in the Commons and his speech of the 17th of March in Birmingham. The former was what he thought, the latter was what he thought the voters wanted. The unilateral guarantee of Poland given by Chamberlain on the 31st of March 1939 was also a reflection of what he believed the voters wanted. He had no intention of ever fulfilling the guarantee if it could possibly be evaded and, for this reason, refused the Polish requests for a small rearmament loan and to open immediate staff discussions to implement the guarantee. The Milner Group, less susceptible to public opinion, did not want the guarantee to Poland at all. As a result, the guarantee was worded to cover Polish independence and not her territorial integrity. This was interpreted by the leading article of the Times for the 1st of April to leave the way open to territorial revision without revoking the guarantees. This interpretation was accepted by Chamberlain in Commons on the 3rd of April. Apparently the government believed that it was making no real commitment because if war broke out in Eastern Europe, British public opinion would force the government to declare war on Germany, no matter what the government itself wanted, and regardless whether the guarantee existed or not. On the other hand, a guarantee to Poland might deter Hitler from precipitating a war and give the government time to persuade the Polish government to yield the corridor to Germany. If the Poles could not be persuaded, or if Germany marched, the fat was in the fire anyway. If the Poles could be persuaded to yield, the guarantee was so worded that Britain could not act under it to prevent such yielding. This was to block any possibility that British public opinion might refuse to accept po a Polish Munich. That this line of thought was not far distant from British government circles is indicated by a Reuters news dispatch released on the same day that Chamberlain gave the guarantee to Poland. This dispatch indicated that, under cover of the guarantee, Britain would put pressure on Poland to make substantial concessions to Hitler through negotiations. According to Hugh Dalton, Labour MP, speaking in Commons on the 3rd of April, this dispatch was inspired by the government and was issued through either the Foreign Office, Sir Horace Wilson, John Simon or Samuel Hoare. Three of these four were of the Milner Group, the fourth being the personal agent of Chamberlain. Dalton's charge was not denied by any government spokesman. Hoare, contenting himself with a request to Dalton to justify that statement. Another MP of Churchill's group suggested that Geoffrey Dawson was the source, but Dalton rejected this. 
It is quite clear that neither the Chamberlain Group nor the Milner Group wanted an alliance with the Soviet Union to stop Hitler in 1939, and that the negotiations were not sincere or vigorously pursued. The Milner Group was not so opposed to such an agreement as the Chamberlain Group. Both were committed to the Four Power Pact. In the case of the Chamberlain Group, this pact could easily have developed into an anti-Russian alliance, but in the case of the Milner Group, it was regarded merely as a link between the Oceanic Bloc and a Germanic Middle Europa. Both groups hated and despised the Soviet Union, but the Milner Group did not fear it as the Chamberlain Group did. This fear was based on the Marxist threat to the British economic system, and the Milner Group was not wedded nearly as closely to that system as Chamberlain and his friends. The Toynbee-Milner tradition, however weak it had become by 1939, was enough to prevent the two groups from seeing eye to eye on this issue. The efforts of the Chamberlain Group to continue the policy of appeasement by making economic and other concessions to Germany, and their efforts to get Hitler to agree to a four-power pact, form one of the most shameful episodes in the history of recent British diplomacy. These negotiations were chiefly conducted through Sir Horace Wilson, and consisted chiefly of offers of colonial bribes and other concessions to Germany. These offers were either rejected or ignored by the Nazis. One of these offers revolved around a semi-official economic agreement under which British and German industrialists would form cartel agreements in all fields to fix prices of their products and divide up the world's markets. The Milner Group apparently objected to this on the grounds that it was aimed, or could be aimed, at the United States. Nevertheless, the agreement continued, a master agreement negotiated at Dusseldorf between representatives of British and German industry was signed in London on the 16th of March 1939. A British government mission to Berlin to help Germany exploit the newly acquired areas of Eastern Europe was postponed the same day because of the strength of public feeling against Germany. As soon as this had died down, secret efforts were made through R.S. Hudson, Secretary to the Department of Overseas Trade, to negotiate with Helmuth Wolfat, Reich Commissioner of the Four-Year Plan. He was in London to negotiate an international whaling agreement. Although Wolfat had no powers, he listened to Hudson and later to Sir Horace Wilson, but refused to discuss the matter with Chamberlain. Wilson offered, one, a non-aggression pact with Germany, two, a delimitation of spheres among the great powers, three, colonial concessions in Africa along the lines previously mentioned, four, an economic agreement. These conversations, reported to Berlin by Ambassador Dirksen in a dispatch on the 21st of July 1939, would have involved giving Germany a free hand in Eastern Europe, and bringing her into collision with Russia. One sentence of Dirksen says, quote, Sir Horace Wilson definitely told her was that, that the conclusion of a non-aggression pact would enable Britain to rid herself of her commitments vis-à-vis -vis Poland. Close quote. In another report, three days later, Dirksen said, quote, Public opinion is so inflamed, and the warmongers and intriguers are so much in the ascendancy, that if these plans of negotiations with Germany were to become public, they would immediately be torpedoed by Churchill and other incendiaries with the cry, No Second Munich! Close quote. The truth of this statement was seen when news of the Hudson Wall that conversations did leak out, and resulted in a violent controversy in the House of Commons, in which the Speaker of the House reportedly broke off the debate to protect the government. According to press adviser Hess in the German Embassy in London, the leak was made by the French Embassy to force a break in the negotiations. The negotiations, however, were already bogged down because of the refusal of the Germans to become very interested in them. 
Hitler and Ribbentrop by this time despised the British so thoroughly that they paid no attention at all to them, and the German ambassador in London found it impossible to reach Ribbentrop, his official superior, either by dispatch or personally. Chamberlain, however, in his eagerness to make economic concessions to Germany, gave to Hitler £6 million in Czechoslovak gold in the Bank of England, and kept Lord Runciman busy training to be chief economic negotiator in the great agreement which he envisaged. On the 29th of July 1939, Court, the German charge d'affaires in London, had a long talk with Charles Roden Buxton, brother of the Labour peer Lord Noel Buxton, about the terms of this agreement, which was to be patterned on the agreement of 1907 between Britain and Russia. Buxton insisted that his visit was quite unofficial, but Court was inclined to believe that his visit was a feeler from the Chamberlain group. In view of the close parallel between Buxton's views and Chamberlain's, this seems very likely. This was corroborated when Sir Horace Wilson repeated these views in a highly secret conversation with Dirksen at Wilson's home from 4 to 6 p.m. on the 3rd of August 1939. Dirksen's minute of the same day shows that Wilson's aims had not changed. He wanted a four-power pact, a free hand for Germany and Eastern Europe, a colonial agreement, an economic agreement, etc. The memorandum reads, in part, quote, After recapitulating his conversation with Walfat, Sir Horace Wilson expatriated at length on the great risk Chamberlain would incur by starting confidential negotiations with the German government. If anything about them were to leak out, there would be a grand scandal, and Chamberlain would probably be forced to resign. Close quote. Dirksen did not see how any binding agreement could be reached under conditions such as this. Quote, For example, owing to Hudson's indiscretion, another visit of her Wolfat to London was out of the question. Close quote. To this, Wilson suggested that quote, the two emissaries could meet in Switzerland or elsewhere. Close quote. The political portions of this conversation were largely repeated in an interview that Dirksen had with Lord Halifax on the 9th of August 1939. It was not possible to conceal these activities completely from the public, and, indeed, government spokesmen referred to them occasionally in trial balloons. On the 3rd of May, Chamberlain suggested an Anglo-German non-aggression pact, although only five days earlier Hitler had denounced the Anglo-German naval agreement of 1935 and the Polish-German non-aggression pact of 1934. As late as the 28th of August, Sir Neville Henderson offered Germany a British alliance if she were successful in direct negotiations with the Poles. This, however, was a personal statement and probably went further than Halifax would have been willing to go by 1939. Halifax apparently had little faith in Chamberlain's ability to obtain any settlement with the Germans. If by means of another Munich, he could have obtained a German-Polish settlement that would satisfy Germany and avoid war, he would have taken it. It was the hope of such an agreement that prevented him from making any real agreement with Russia, for it was, apparently, the expectation of the British government that if the Germans could get the Polish corridor by negotiation, they could then drive into Russia across the Baltic states. For this reason, in the negotiations with Russia, Halifax refused any multilateral pact against aggression, any guarantee of the Baltic states, or any tripartite guarantee of Poland. Instead, he sought to get nothing more than a unilateral Russian guarantee to Poland to match the British guarantee to the same country. It was much too dangerous for Russia to swallow, since it would leave her with a commitment which could lead to war, and with no promise of British aid to her 
if she were attacked directly after a Polish settlement or indirectly across the Baltic states. Only after the German-Soviet non-aggression pact of the 21st of August 1939 did Halifax implement the unilateral guarantee to Poland with a more formal mutual assistance pact between Britain and Poland. This was done to warn Hitler that an attack on Poland would bring Britain into the war under pressure of British public opinion. Hitler, as usual, paid no attention to Britain. Even after the German attack on Poland, the British government was reluctant to fulfil this pact and spent almost three days asking the Germans to return to negotiation. Even after the British were forced to declare war on Germany, they made no effort to fight, contenting themselves with dropping leaflets on Germany. We now know that the German generals had moved so much of their forces to the east that they were gravely worried at the effects which might follow an Allied attack on Western Germany or even an aerial bombing of the Ruhr. In these events of 1939, the Milner Group took little part. They must have known of the negotiations with Germany and probably did not disapprove of them but they had little faith in them, and by the early summer of 1939 were probably convinced that war with Germany was inevitable in the long run. In this view, Halifax probably shared, but other former members of the group, such as Hoare and Simon, by now were completely in the Chamberlain group, and can no longer be regarded as members of the Milner group. From June 1939 to May 1940, the fissure between the Milner Group and the Chamberlain government became wider. From the outbreak of war, the Milner Group were determined to fight the war against Germany. The Chamberlain Group, on the other hand, were very reluctant to fight Germany, preferring to combine a declared but unfought war with Germany with a fought but undeclared war with Russia. The excuse for this last arose from the Russian pressure on Finland for bases to resist a future German attack. The Russian attack on Finland began on the last day of November 1939. By the 27th of December, the British and French were putting pressure on Sweden to join them in action to support the Finns. In these notes, which have been published by the Swedish Foreign Ministry, the Western powers stated that they intended to send men, equipment and money to Finland. By February 1940, the Western powers had plans for a force of 30,000 to 40,000 men for Finland and were putting pressure on Sweden to allow passage for this force across Scandinavia. By the 2nd of March 1940, the British had a force of 100,000 men ready and informed the Swedish and Norwegian governments that, quote, the force, with its full equipment, is available and could sail at short notice, close quote. They invited the Scandinavian countries to receive Allied missions to make all the necessary preparations for the transit. The note to Norway, in an additional passage, said that forces would be sent to the Norwegian ports within four days of receiving permission, and the transit itself would begin on the 20th of March. On the 12th of March, the Allies sent to the Scandinavian countries a formal request for right of transit. It was refused. Before anything further could be done, Finland collapsed and made peace with Russia. On the 5th of April, Halifax sent a very threatening note to the Scandinavian countries. It said, in part, Considering, in consultation with the French government, the circumstances attending the termination of the war between the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics and Finland, and the attitude adopted by the Swedish government at the time, they feel, therefore, that the time has come to notify the Swedish government frankly of certain vital interests and requirements which the Allied governments intend to assert and defend by whatever measure they may think necessary. 
the vital interests and the requirements which the Allied governments wish to bring to the notice of the Swedish government are the following. A. The Allied governments cannot acquiesce in any further attack on Finland by either the Soviet or German governments. In the event, therefore, of such an attack taking place, any refusal by the Swedish government to facilitate the efforts of Allied governments to come to the assistance of Finland in whatever manner they may think fit, and still more any attempt to prevent such assistance, would be considered by the Allied governments as endangering their vital interests. C. Any attempt by the Soviet government to obtain from Norway a footing on the Atlantic seaboard would be contrary to the vital interests of the Allied governments. The Swedish Foreign Minister expressed his government's astonishment at this note, and its determination to decide such questions for itself, and to preserve Sweden's neutrality in the future, as it had been preserved in the past. It is not clear what was the attitude of the Milner Group towards this effort to open active hostilities against the Soviet Union while remaining technically in a state of war with Germany. Halifax was still at the Foreign Office and apparently actively concerned in this project. The Times was wholeheartedly in favour of the plan. On the 5th of March, for example, it said of the Finnish war, quote, it is becoming clearer every day that this war is no side issue. Finland is defending more than the cause of liberty and more than her own soil. Our own cause is being buttressed by her resistance to the evil of tyranny. Our interest is clear, and there is a moral issue involved as well as the material. The whole sentiment of this country demands that Finland should not be allowed to fall. Close quote. The round table, in the only issue which appears during the Finnish Troubles, had a propagandist article on the civilization of Finland. It called Finland, quote, one of the most democratic nations on any definition in all Europe. Close quote. The rest of the article was a paean of praise of the kind of magnanimous conduct of the Finnish government in every crisis of its history from 1917, but nothing was said about the Finnish war, nor was there any mention of Allied aid. During this period, the Milner Group became increasingly impatient with the Chamberlain Group. This was clear from the June 1940 issue of the Round Table, which criticised the Cabinet reshuffle of April as evoking almost universal derision. It also criticised Chamberlain's failure to include able members of his own party in the cabinet. This may have been a reference to Amory's continued exclusion. The article said, quote, This lack of imagination and courage could be seen in almost every aspect of the Chamberlain government's conduct of the war. Close quote. It excluded Simon and Hoare as possible Prime Ministers on the grounds that they were too close to Chamberlain. It was probably thinking of Halifax as Prime Minister, but when the time came, others thought him also to be too closely associated with appeasement. On the crucial day, the 8th of May 1940, the group was badly split. In fact, on the division that preceded Chamberlain's resignation, Lady Astor voted against the government, while her brother-in-law, John Jacob Astor, voted with the government. The debate was one of the most bitter in recent history, and reached its high point when Amory cried out to the government benches the words of Cromwell, "'You have sat too long here for any good you have been doing.' Depart, I say, and let us have done with you. In the name of God, go. In the ensuing division, the whips were on with a vengeance, but the government's majority was only 81, more than a hundred Conservatives abstaining from voting. 
most of the Milner Group members, since they held offices in the government, had to vote with it. Of the inner core, only Amory and Lady Astor broke away. In the majority, still supporting Chamberlain, were J. J. Astor, Grigg, Hoare, Malcolm MacDonald, Salter, Simon and Somerville. But the fight had been too bitter. Chamberlain was replaced by Churchill, and Amory came to office as Secretary of State for India. Once again, the Milner Group and the government were united on the issues. Both, from the 8th of May 1940, had only one aim – to win the war with Germany.